who welcome to this lecture. And uh, my name is Olli Pekka Hilmola, and I represent the LUT University Kouvola unit. And uh, we are one partner in this project Green in the Traffic, which is run, uh, funded by CBC 2014 to 2020, Southeast Finland, Russia. So funding is coming from uh, Finland, Russia, and the European Union. And um, in this uh, presentation uh, and interactive lecture, I'm um, introducing you my chapter of the um, book uh, from the book manual, which we produced for this project. And uh, my lecture is entitled as Eurasia Supply Chains, Total Cost, Lead Time and Emissions. And uh, then I will uh, introduce uh, the content of my lecture. I will first of all, I will uh, introduce you what kind of alternatives we have in Euro Asian supply chains for transportation, logistics and supply chains. Uh, then I will uh, review current situation in transportation markets. Um, you all know that uh, we are, uh, when I'm recording this lecture, we are in the midst of this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and um, even if uh, I, I think, the, let's say, impact of this uh, virus has still been rather limited, I'm, I'm, I'm glad from it, but let's say that the impacts for economies and, uh, um, let's say, consumption, investments, and also transportation, which is service, which is serving the, the different actors, it has been significant already and uh, it has um, changed many things for worse. But we need to, uh, let's say, review the current situation, how we got here, and then we can maybe see where we are heading. And uh, then I'm uh, motivating this um, railway use through uh, transportation emissions. I'm basically using European Union uh, emission counting and uh, annual uh, notifications from that and we will go through and see how important uh, it is that we apply more and more railways especially replacing road and air transportation and in this chapter i, I was uh, speculated that we, we could and should replace air transportation air freight by using more rail container transport from for example from china then, then I'm to Europe, and uh, then I'm, in, uh, let's say, introducing the Im uh, import importance of China to European countries in trade and unbalances. I'm showing some what I have done recently in research. Then I'm experiencing two hypothetical examples with Fourier interactive simulation model. Um, so it is this uh, what we can you can all use online without any cost. And I'm going through those models, what I'm also illustrating you in the book chapter. And then I will finally conclude uh, my presentation. Okay, let's uh, review and uh, go through three main uh, transportation modes uh, reaching uh, from Europe to China. Um, in my examples, I have a um, mostly starting point uh, in Finland. And uh, for example, in this uh, air freight example, it is in Helsinki, Helsinki Vanta Airport and then in some others it is Kovola and so on but uh, in, in the book I'm using of course St. Petersburg because of this project and uh, in St. Petersburg for example we have Pulkovo airport which is equal to Helsinki Vanta airport and there are as much as connections as from Helsinki and very good connectivity to China as well um, let's start from this air freight um, option you, you, as you can all see is that uh, as we are using air freight um, the advantage is uh, clearly distance uh, this is the shortest possible because the uh, world is round and we are starting from north and um, it, it is it is shortest it is the most convenient in a way that it is it reaches in the shortest time as well and, uh, but uh, as a downside, it emits a lot of emissions. And uh, secondly, is that uh, it, is, it is typically very expensive. And uh, as we all can see that now we have in the middle of this uh, pandemic, air freight doesn't work or it is working only limit in limited fashion. 
Air freight is always coupled together with uh, passenger transport. We have, of course, freight liners. We have uh, freight um, aeroplanes um, operating, but um, passengers are very important. Um, uh, it could be said that uh, airlines, they are making money from uh, business class and then uh, from freight and then others are just to make get some revenue and uh, covering some costs. But uh, this one here is the one option. We start from Helsinki and for example and to Xi'an in the uh, middle of uh, China. Um, I will show this because I need to go through some other slides too, it is easier to select. So you can see that th this option has a uh, distance of 6,413 kilometers based on Finnair um, routing counter. Uh, I hope it, it is correct, but I think it's correct. So it is not as far away. Think about um, what is the distance from Finland to Spain. You can, you can all uh, measure the distance, for example, with Google Maps and uh, you can figure it out that China is not that distant. Even if uh, China is far away, it is not that far away. Every, every week, every day we have connectivity to Spain. They are bringing fruits, vegetables and so on to Finland. Uh, why not to other Eurasian countries? Why not? Then um, another option is that we use sea freight. Sea freight is uh, more complicated. Uh, sea freight is typically taking long, or and it is having longest lead time from all. Um, and the reason is that the sea freight is um, it, it is managed that it will reach maximum efficiency. And uh, they are using, let's say, enormous scale in, in sea transportation, and uh, they can offer very very low costs. And um, because all of these and because um, sea transportation is major and, and it is having the most from the volumes between uh, Europe and Asia, uh, most transportation volume, it is of course very cost competitive. And if we for example start from Helsinki, but same thing if we would start from St. Petersburg, uh, we firstly start with feeder. We don't have any direct, um, let's say, vessel to China from Finland. We don't have any direct vessel, uh, container vessel from St. Petersburg to China. Uh, it is always that we will go proceed from uh, uh, feeder smaller ships, for example, from Finland to, for example, Rotterdam. And uh, then we are loading, unloading containers and loading them to bigger ships, uh, which are possibly heading to China. Poland has some uh, direct connections to China. Of course, Germany has, Netherlands, uh, UK, France, but the all in Northern Europe we are operating to feeder traffic. So it, it adds one more trip, it adds more time, it adds more complexity, and um, it is also adding more cost because we are using smaller vessels. So we are, we are coming um, from Spoke, which is like Helsinki, and we are going to Hoop which is like in Rotterdam or Hamburg or what, whatever bigger uh, Antwerp, whatever big uh, container seaport. So this will start and you can see that this is the first route. And uh, then another route is that uh, we will proceed directly through Suez Canal and uh, and then Mediterranean area, and uh, then Malacca Straits, um, bypassing India to China. Uh, this is, of course, this is if, if you would ask from ordinary man in the streets that uh, what kind, of, what is the route to Asia? This is typical answer. They would be would be wild guessing that uh, this is a, let's say route. And it is as, as we started. Um, Air freight was having this distance of 6,000 and something, 6,003 or 400. In here, we are already talking about 22,000 kilometers. It is rather long. But uh, it is not that uncommon that um, container ships, they use uh, even longer routes. 
For example, at the moment we are in, in this uh, big crisis because of this COVID-19. Uh, when we will come out of this crisis, uh, hopefully soon, uh, most probably we will have a big problem in trade. Uh, we will have a problem that uh, there is not that much demand for transportation because of sl sluggish um, demand for products, because people have lost their jobs and so on. Um, typically in that case, um, transportation companies, they go around Africa because they have too much capacity, so they need to use it somewhere and they're spending it mm, at the sea. Secondly is that they're, they're going in very slow motion, they're saving fuel, and uh, even if we have a now cheap uh, priced oil, in shipping, uh, these environmental regulations, they have uh, increased tremendously uh, cost of the shipping fuels. So even if we have a cheap fuel at the moment, in, in for example, oil price at the, let's say, spot, uh, spot, spot market price, uh, it is not that cheap in the shipping. They have been, especially from the beginning of this year, um, the sulfur regulation increased prices quite much. And uh, this will add more, 8,000 kilometer more uh, to this journey. So we had a 22 here, so it's 8,000 kilometers more. So, um, that's about it. And then as a third option, uh, we have, I think, uh, I have calculations, I was seeking this. This is 30,200 in container and uh, then 22,200 in shorter. But then as a last option, we have the, this option of using land mass. So we are, for example, starting from here. And uh, one natural way of uh, proceeding would be using railways. We have a very good railway system in Russia. Um, of course, good ones in Europe too. And uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Mongolia, China, they have all improved a lot their railway infrastructure, especially China and Kazakhstan. And earlier, if, if we were using uh, railway transportation, we were going through, for example, all through Russia and then ending here to Vladivostok and Nahotka. And then we were using shipping uh, to reach, for example, South Korea, Japan, or China. And then from there, we, we were entering hinterlands of China. That was very typical. That was, um, that was mostly used in early 2000. And it was this kind of uh, standard in that time. Think about this, start from here. And then we go by trans Railway down here and then we ship to different destinations. Then other alternatives um, have appeared, and I'm really glad that uh, they have appeared. We have a Kazakh connection. So we are starting from here, but then we are entering to Kazakhstan, and from Kazakhstan we have a two uh, border crossing points, Horkos and Alashanku, and uh, then we will enter directly Chinese railway system. Of course, uh, we have here, we have a Soviet standard in a uh, course width, but in China, they are following European standard is 1435. In here, we have 1520, 1520, and in Finland, 1524. So we have to change wagons. Um, we have to change wagons or then uh, basically unloading and loading freight as we go through this border. Then another option is that we will go use Mongolia and same uh, situation persists over there. So that we, when we enter China, we need to load, unload and load that we reach uh, Chinese destinations. But these new developments through Kazakhstan, through Mongolia, they're actually really good. Think about earlier our option at railways was so that we needed to go here. And then we were basically able to enter some of these areas here. But now we have all big cities of China. Think about China as having basically 150 to 200, 1 million or more population cities. And uh, of course, we all know Beijing. We know all uh, Shenzhen. Uh, we know all Shanghai. 
uh, Guangdong, but uh, then we have a lot of other cities uh, like Luoyang, Xi'an, and so on. Uh, we, we, have a, we have a lot of uh, different cities there which are, let's say, very potential for uh, growth of trade, growth of commerce, and uh, they, they need to be, let's say, somehow integrated to global trading system. In China, it, it has been so that uh, we have this uh, coastal area, which is, uh, it, it has been uh, improving the economy in the last 20 years a lot. In some cities, bigger cities, it is already so that, uh, let's say, the living standard doesn't differ that much from Europe. In, in some cases, it is even above. But then, if, and that is the reason why it is not that anymore that uh, cheap to manufacture here. So that is the reason why all uh, manufacturing activities going to hinterlands and uh, more to these cities which are over here. So um, uh, I don't have a capability to read Chinese, but you can see here it is a tremendous place. It is a big place. Even after this crisis, it is a big place. So. Uh, it is very welcome this development that we have uh, from Europe. We have this Kazakh and the Mongolian roads, let's say, open and in use. From Finland, we are mostly using nowadays this Kazakh route. But uh, if I will go to St. Petersburg and I ask from logistic companies, many are using this Mongolian route. The uh, Mongolian route is because you can reach some other cities here, for example, Beijing, Tianjin, and uh, others. And the Mongolian route is, I have heard that it is cheap. It is very cost competitive because Mongolia, let's say living standard and salaries in Mongolia are not that high. So very interesting in a way. So these are three options. So air freight, container transport by sea, and then container transport by rail. As a fourth option, we have, of course, uh, we can use road haulage. We can use road transportation. We have every year, for example, if I will check from Finnish statistics, I have been following this for years. We have every year some trucks going from Finland or coming from China to Finland, either way around. And, uh, but it is not going to be a big solution. It is going to be an awful solution for environment. And it is, not all, it is also very expensive if you think about that you have to commit a lot of trucks. Yeah, a lot of drivers and so on. It, it is not a long-term solution, but for some projects, for some rapid things, you need to connect, uh, you need to go to some special cities and so on. So uh, it is good. Okay, then we will proceed to, let's say, transportation markets. Um, I try to explain where we are and a little bit uh, why we are, why, how we got here, why we are here. And uh, then um, I will just try to project a little bit about future. But uh, before we will start to go through this, I would like to show you some other some other data. What was related to let's say previous part is that I was mentioning uh, that we have a lot of uh, let's say big cities in China. What we need to connect in the future because of uh, a lot of commercial potential over there. This is, I was working in China a year ago in Beijing and um, for that work I was doing some, um, let's say, optimization and simulation things for distribution, uh, emissions and so on. Um, for the local university in Beijing, Beijing Yatong University. And you can see that, uh, for example, in here I have uh, 51 largest cities of, of China. And you can see that, uh, of course, some of these 51 larger cities, they have a seaport, so they could be connected with the old model that we will go through Trans-Siberian Railway and then connect, connecting with the uh, uh, container ship. But uh, there are a lot of cities like uh, Beijing, um, Chongqing, Chengdu, Harbin, Wuhan, uh, Hangzhou, Xi'an, Xi'an, Foshan, Yinan, Wengzhou, and so on. They, they, uh, they all need to have a, let's say, they, they are much more better reached by railway connection. Of course, for example, Beijing, um, Tianjin is uh, Beijing's uh, 
seaport city in a way, and it is not long distance, but still Beijing is without seaports, so that is very important to note. But let's go back here. Is that um, in um, life before 2008 and 9 um, was different uh, what it has been for last decade in shipping. Even if we had a tremendous, uh, let's say, I don't know, bubble or uh, appreciation of values of, for example, real estate, uh, some stock market uh, listed companies, uh, then other investments like fine art and so on. Uh, transportation itself has been in very difficult position and especially sea transportation after 2008 and 2009 crisis. And uh, mostly it is because before 2008 and 9 crisis we were so optimistic that uh, let's say managers, directors of that time and bankers of that time before we invested too much to ships and there were too many investments in pipeline before 2008 and 2009 crash happened. And then we decided that we will not abandon those orders, but uh, they, are, they are going to be delivered, but they are not delivered in 2010 or 2009, but they are delivered a little bit postponed. And this has, the, let's say, lead to a situation that where we have, a, even in container shipping, it is uh, the worst case is uh, dry bulk, but uh, in container shipping, we have too much capacity and uh, not that much demand. So we, we built over capacity and we are still suffering from it. And this can be seen from, for example, I've taken from this kind of pipe of shipping review of maritime transport. You can all access it without any cost from UNCTAD. Uh, UNCTAD. It is United Nations. And you can all see how prices have developed over the years of one, for example, 40 feet uh, equivalent unit transported from Shanghai to United States West Coast. So you can see that uh, it started 2010 was of course year of recovery, it, uh, these rates a little bit recovered and thereafter it has been not straight line down but um, mostly down. 2018-2019 was good years in a way, in a way that uh, especially 2019 was good year for container shipping but this current year 2020 is going to be awful again. Uh, if we for example go to check uh, Northern Europe, Shanghai Northern Europe route, you can see that how low it can go. Of course this is 20 uh, foot equivalent unit, so it is um, let's say 50% uh, smaller container, but still it is extremely cheap to transport. Think about less than $1,000, sometimes $600 to transport container from China to you. And uh, basically it is amazing that uh, how this rate can be so low because uh, typically we have a lot of transport from China to Europe but not that much from Europe to China. And uh, this development is all over the world. You can even check this uh, South America, Africa, uh, then intra-Asia. It is it's, uh, pretty much everywhere this, uh, let's say, price decline. Even this uh, Shanghai Persian Gulf, you can see that how much it has declined. And think about how much prices have increased during this period. So shipping has been in very difficult position, and this has this hasn't enabled railway transportation because railway is typically higher cost than container shipping, and uh, therefore it is not e easy to grow in in that sense in Euro Asian transport. Uh, after 2008 and 9 crisis, for example, we have uh, this uh, Baltic Fry, Baltic Dirty Tanker, uh, Baltic Clean Tanker indexes, what we can follow. This is from one of book what I wrote in 2010-11, and uh, in there I, I, was, uh, I was stating that uh, we over-invested and uh, this recession will, let's say, continue a long time. So uh, even if we stimulated the economy, even if the economy started a little bit grow, but we just too much invested to shipping and uh, that resulted on the, let's say, depressing rates for, for the end of the decade. And uh, I think this uh, COVID-19 will uh, again enforce this decline. You can all see here these are the shipping rates. You can see here are the main actors of shipping, how much they lost in stock values. And uh, 
then you can see how Baltic Dry Index has there after after this book was released. I think it was released in 2012. It was published, and uh, you can see how much it has uh, decreased thereafter. So we in Baltic Dry we started with a price level of 11,000, nearly 500. Think about. It. So many shipping companies were, let's say, making a lot of money in uh, 2008, 2007. But think about how low this, uh, let's say, price index in freight transport of uh, dry bulk has, dec let's say, decreased. It is, it is awful. This, uh, this is, of course, now in COVID. So we, we had a little bit better situation. And we had hopes of uh, higher rates because we had um, a lot of climate change things and uh, sustainability issues implemented in shipping, more regulations, higher costs for fuel and so on. But uh, this is the current situation. It is really awful. It is not as awful as in 2016, but uh, getting there, it is um, at the level of 2015. So shipping has been in big, big trouble. Then another, yet another, index is um, Shanghai Condensed Freight Index, which is uh, especially following what is the, let's say, price of transport from China to all over the world by containers. And uh, you can see that 2015, as I referred, and 16, it was really bad, so it, it declined. Uh, then we had again recovery. Many people were in Finland, for example, saying that uh, this is it, it will, it will again start to boom, it will increase the prices, uh, the prices will continue to increase and uh, then we will have a more railway transport, more air freight, but no, uh, it dropped again. And then we had again in 2000, late 2018 and early 2019, we had a boom, but then again freight uh, rates decreased. And then in the late 2019, we had again boom in here, but, and this is because um, all of these environmentally strict measures were implemented like sulfur regulation globally from the beginning of 2020. So it of course have increased the freight prices, but um, you know that this current price is so big, so even prices are still dec uh, decreasing. So it is again interesting. It is it, Prices in container transport are not the same like uh, what I was talking here this Baltic dry. Baltic dry is overall, it contains a lot of dry bulk like wheat, uh, coal, and so on. So uh, in here we have uh, only container. And the reason why we are here is that, uh, as I told you, is that we have a uh, too few demand, and uh, then we have a uh, too massive supply all the time, for example, to container markets. And that is the reason why we have, uh, let's say, lower prices and uh, price depression all the time. In 2019 it was looking good and everybody was thinking that the, from the beginning of 2020 things will improve and shipping will prosper again, but oh no, we are here back again in the same depression, it will continue. So shipping has been, we have in shipping, we have these cycles, we have shipping cycles, so the shipping cycles don't turn so quickly. So um, it could take another 10 years even after this COVID, you never know. Or then there will be more bankruptcies, like uh, there was Han Han Shipping bankruptcy in 2016. So it uh, removed capacity. And of course, well, I told you, these shipping companies, they have been suffering a lot. Uh, they have lost a lot from their, for example, from their market value. So uh, investors have lost a lot of money. Uh, some bigger players and some niche players like Talink, they have been able to, let's say, fight back. And uh, Muller Mask has been able to sustain, but in this recent, uh, let's say, COVID uh, crisis, even everyone has suffered a lot, even further. This, uh, earlier, this, for example, uh, K-Line from Japan or Costco from China, they have lost, but uh, also Talink and Muller Mask have lost a lot, so it is... Uh, these are in big uh, crisis um, now, and if we project the future, we can see two different things probably happening is that uh, container shipping, they will uh, most pro probably offer uh, lower prices or competitive prices. I, I don't know, lower prices is not an uh, appropriate term, but uh, let's say competitive prices against other transportation modes. 
because they're in so big trouble. And uh, then we have this environmental regulation, which will increase the prices. And uh, if we think about uh, airlines at the moment, uh, airlines are also in big trouble and this freight segment over there is in big trouble. Only sector which is not in trouble uh, in, in freight is railways. But of course in railways many, uh, let's say governments are still having railway companies which are operating boats, freight and passengers merely in monopolistic terms. Uh, they are in big trouble because they have lost passenger transport or much of it. Uh, similarly to air transport, but uh, I would say that this uh, long distance freight transport by railways, it is going to benefit from this uh, current crisis, when we come out of this crisis. Uh, container shipping will of course fight and take its share, but uh, air transport it will be in big trouble, air freight will be in big trouble. I, I don't know how these companies will survive, how many of them will survive. It is very difficult to say. Then a few words about the um, importance of China in, um, for example, in European trade. Same thing, uh, same kind of development I can detect from Russia, but I'm not showing here. But um, China is getting all the time more and more important. Um, this is, um, I've written this article to and done this research together with my Russian Chinese colleague, <coughs> Yulia Panova. And um, it is now in the evaluation of, of some uh, quite good uh, Russian journal. You can see that we have a Russian translation of uh, abstract. Uh, we have abstract in uh, English and Russian, and then we have an entire uh, article in English. But let's go and see on a rough level. Um, this is European Union 28, so it also includes United Kingdom. Um, of course, we have now Brexit effective, so this is a little bit history, historical. But um, this is EU 28, and uh, you can see how Chinese, US, and the world trade has developed over the years. So China and USA, they play a very important role for Europe in trade. And um, their importance have only grown, because they have grown from 2008 and 9 crisis much more higher rate than the world in total. And uh, especially Chinese trade has grown. Uh, but USA hasn't done so poorly either. So both have shown nice development. And uh, Chinese trade is nowadays, it is basically the same neighborhood with USA. So um, you can get the idea, so it is 710 billion it was uh, US dollars, it was in 2018. And uh, US trade was uh, 786 billion US dollars in uh, 2018. So, and uh, you can see here is that uh, the share of uh, US and China from uh, overall world trade of EU 28 it has all the time getting bigger and bigger, so it, they are getting more important because it grows, they both grow, or have grown. Of course, problem uh, with the Chinese trade is that uh, nearly all European countries, they have a trade deficit with China. At the moment, all, yes. There have been some exceptions like Finland in year 2000, uh, was it 11? We were having a trade surplus with China, but um, thereafter only deficit and deficit. But uh, you can see that uh, it is deficit and it means that we have a lot of things coming from China and we are not sending enough things over there. We can send some bulky products, but um, the Chinese are not paying high enough price and so th that results in trade deficit. So, for example, in container transport, typically it is so that we have uh, more containers coming from China than leaving from Europe to China. Uh, of course, Finland is exception because we have a lot of uh, this kind of industries which uh, China utilize, like pulp and paper industries, forest industry, uh, food industry. So, and that is the reason why we have a good balance in Finland in container, let's say, trade with China. Uh, actually, when we have these uh, train trials in Finland, we have quite often had more items to transport to China than other way around. But from Central Europe, it has been so that uh, they are 
having problems to find cargo from Europe to China, but other way they have. Yeah, of course, US trade is uh, having uh, surplus, remarkable surplus. Then if you look <coughs> overall trade figures, import and export together, it is, we can look, for example, averages from 2009 and 2018 era, <coughs> so this 10-year period. Or we can look at the numbers of 2018. Uh, we all can conclude easily is that Germany is leading trade partner with China and Europe. It, it's just a fact. Uh, it used to be so that Germany was having similar sized trade with China, what United Kingdom, France and Netherlands had. But even in 2018, I think they surplus, Germany surplus these three as well. Or in other way, we can calculate all countries together from Spain down to Malta. And uh, it is uh, at the level of uh, Germany. So, um, it is, it is, uh, you, you can see from here the article, um, what, what I've concluded. It would be, Germany would be actually larger, in, even if we calculate everyone from uh, uh, Spain to Malta, uh, starting from here to here. Germany would still be large. Uh, Germany is, of course, quite much dependent on the Chinese trade. It is over 8% from their overall trade. Uh, United Kingdom, Czech Republic, uh, France, Poland, they are all, uh, Finland, they are all, these are all pretty much dependent on the Chinese trade. Uh, Latvia, Luxembourg, Portugal, and Lithuania, they are not that dependent. And then, uh, if we look trade balance, it is awful reading. Everywhere we have a deficit, as I told you. Everywhere, every country. So it is very devastating in 10 years because you cannot judge, let's say, one country, let's say, pair by one year. You have to look longer perspective. I have used here 10 years, so it is all the time deficits. And as I told you that uh, in 2000, 11, Finland had a, a surplus within Chinese trade, and it is actually still the only one in US dollar terms in this 10-year period, which was the only country in the whole 10-year period which was able to show surplus with China. That only illustrates how powerful China is in trade, uh, for example, with, with regard to European countries. Of course, uh, some countries are more awful positioned than the others. So in here, it means that, for example, Poland is having, every time Poland exports something to China, China will export more than 12 times worth back to Poland. Same thing with the Czech Republic, it is 10 times. So every time Czech Republic sends something to China, um, China will send 10 times more back to Czech Republic. Estonia, and Malta, Slovenia are in, in also very difficult position as well. So we have to go here to see the best performers and um, I'm glad that Finland is uh, over here. So Finland, even if in Finland we have a big trade deficit in absolute terms to China, we are still one of the best in if we evaluate with uh, how much uh, we export and how much we import. If we make this kind of ratio multiplier, we calculate uh, import divided by export. So F Sweden is the best one, followed by Ireland, Germany, Finland, and then Bulgaria. Of course, I I wouldn't make so big conclusion with being hesitant over here because uh, Czech Republic and Poland, they are very strong in manufacturing, so they must have a lot of imports of se semi-finished uh, products and components from, from China. That must be one explaining factor. Of course, another one is that they just uh, they have some brands over there where they don't like to consume Chinese products because they're cheap. And then they, let's say Czech Republic and Poland, they have, and also Estonia, they have shown remarkable economic growth in recent 
uh, 20 years, but they started from very low levels and maybe their consumption habits are different, their brands are a little bit different than the others. So this is the starting point. Is that it's very difficult in general to find cargo from Europe, same thing from uh, Russia to China, but from China to Russia or China to Europe, it is easy to find, so or easier. And that is the problem because in railway transportation, you always need to find balance. You need to have a balanced system in order that it can function and it can be competitive. Okay, in this part, we will uh, use this Forio interactive simulation tool and I will introduce how you can open it. The key thing is that you have a browser which is able to run Java. So Java is a little bit old, um, let's say programming language, but uh, we still have a process which are using it, for example, Firefox in my, my computer. But first of all, uh, please all type in this uh, address to your browser. So I will show it here a couple of seconds. And uh, now I will copy it and uh, I will open my Firefox. And uh, in Firefox, I will just type in this uh, this address. Let's try it again. Maybe some misunderstanding or malfunction. Here you can see here are my all of my simulations. What I have built here. These are built with uh, they are actually a real simulation with real simulation programs. But I have just imported them, modified them, I have made. Um, um, interactive menus uh, that uh, people can run different simulation scenarios and so on. So basically it's Forio is a platform where you can uh, bring your si complicated simulations and then everybody can use even if you don't have any background in simulation and uh, or knowledge. Just you just change some variables in the menus and it will show you the results. You can see that uh, some of my simulations have been uh, let's say successful um, having users of 50, but then I have some uh, simulations which haven't received any interest at all. <laughs> but let's go to this um, um, lecture simulation model. So it is this Eurasian land bridge. I will run this simulation just by clicking. And then I have this um, question whether I should run uh, Adobe Flash. I will click here and I will allow it should work. Sometimes it takes a little bit time. And uh, now it is, uh, let's say, downloading information. And uh, now it is running this, this app running through American server. I have here two pictures from uh, Eurasian Land Bridge. Uh, this is actually from Horgos. And this is, I think, from, um, this is not from, it is also Eurasian Land Bridge, but this is, I think, from uh, um, Lithuania. So in, in some border over there. So these are these kind of um, intermodal nodes you have uh, when, when you are transporting long distances in, in the railway system. Actually, in here they are changing from Chinese cores to um, Russian cores. And uh, so we have uh, some some trains are coming here from China, for example. Then they are unloading them to European cores over here. And you can see that there is a big big lifts here. So uh, forklifts are really, really big. This is uh, and this is high volume place. The high volume place. This one here is um, a smaller volume, but the pr in principle the same. It is uh, trains are coming with uh, European cores, and then they are changed to Russian cores because Baltic states are using still today uh, Russian cores. Of course, um, in the future when they have a real Baltic, it might change, but uh, still today it is it is this in principle. And we here you can see, I think you are all familiar with the um, container transport dimensions. I'm, I'm explaining that we are using here tail containers. I'm, I'm explaining uh, what kind of background variables we have. Uh, we have a uh, what kind of price erosion, meaning that how, how much money we are losing every week that we are storing this because products need to wait when they're transported, for example, to Europe from China. So we lose value every week because uh, products will come older and older and older. Then we, we have to 
finance this inventory holding somehow, somebody's paying uh, because we have a one container full of electronics could uh, easily cost 100,000 or, or 1 million even or, or several millions. It depends. Uh, for example, cell phones are very expensive. And uh, then we have here the price of an item. It is 50 USD per unit. But let's go and because in our example, in our book example, which is this, uh, we are evaluating that whether we should use this Eurasian land bridge uh, between Saint Petersburg and Xi'an in China, so Russia, China. Um, and uh, in the assumptions, uh, we have, I think, 200 uh, USD per unit. So, per parcel. So, um, in, in our originally, it is 50 in the simulation, but let's go and change it. So, we have here the basic assumptions of the simulations. And let's go and change it. So, here you have a price of an item. I will increase this to 200. And I will keep this same because uh, these variables, they are the same in this simulation model. So, price erosion is 27% per year. So it is typical, um, I have taken this from, uh, because I have been studying electronics industry for, I don't know, I started in the uh, late 90s and uh, I have a lot of studies. It is typically so that in electronics items get 30, 35%, 40% cheaper in a year. It is the, let's say, that is the deterioration of technology, that is the speed, you know. The cell phone which is new today costs 250 in store, in one year the same model will cost 100 or 150 or, uh, or 185 and so on. So of course it depends, but on the average, uh, based on studies, it is around 35, 30, 40% what, uh, what they lose in value. And then I have this uh, inventory holding cost. It is 16.1% per year. It is rather conservative, but we have, at the moment, we have our interest rates are so low. So I will proceed to simulation from here. And this simulation is rather technical, it is not so fancy, we don't have any, that much animation. But when we start this, it is a, bit, a little bit awkward because I have the simulation is a little more, uh, let's say, complicated. I have here emissions from uh, two different databases and different um, uh, transportation modes. And then I have, for each one, I have em how much they emit. So we, we need to start from the CO2 emissions, otherwise we are not able to change them. And in our article, in my article, uh, what is in book, um, the first example is this uh, air transportation from, uh, for example, from Xi'an, China to Bukko, St. Petersburg. And um, you can see here is that uh, we have uh, air long distance. So it is here, it is, uh, preliminary selected uh, air long distance, but we have other, let's say, a lot of different uh, selections over here. But we will use in this first hypothetical example this air long distance. And then 95% uh, of this uh, transportation is completed by this air transportation. Then 5% is by road transportation. And I have selected this 33 from, uh, let's say, semi-trailer uh, for transportation for the from, from the very beginning, because factories seldom are at the airport. So you always need to have some connective transportation to the airport. And from, for example, from Pulkova Airport in St. Petersburg, you need to have some connective air transportation to terminal, yes? So that is the reason why we have 5% for this. So we have primary transportation mode. It is this air transportation, and it is 95%. And then we have secondary transportation mode, which is this road transportation. Then this uh, distance, uh, in article, uh, I think distance is 6,500, I think so. Yes, it is 6,500, yes. And uh, then our container will weigh, uh, it is 10 tons. And then we assume that uh, in here we have, uh, it is 30, uh, USD per ton of emitted CO2. Then we will go to transportation costs and uh, we will change over here. We will change so that uh, this delivery time is one. So it is one week, overall one week. Uh, container utilization, let's see. I 
think uh, content utilization now example is 85 it's so and the freight will cost uh, 5000 and uh, now we can proceed uh, let's proceed for example six weeks you, so you can all see that we have here the computer is calculating server in america it is calculating us all of these variables so price per item is 5055 it is the same like in book and uh, then the total price of uh, container transported it is 7109 and it is coming from these three factors it is this container freight price then we have this price erosion because these products lose value in this one week time and uh, then uh, we have a uh, inventory holding cost and uh, these together uh, are summed here and it is 7109 it is the total sum and please remember that our um, container is very expensive it, it is full of uh, items which are having a worth of 200 usd so that is the reason why these numbers are rather big because it is so valuable it is full of electronics uh, we can go and look these co2 emissions and you can see that the co2 emissions are rather high they are approaching 40 uh, tons in this uh, let's say supply chain and if we would pay something from CO2 emissions like 30 USD, the cost would be closing to 1,200 USD. It's quite much if you think about uh, that. Uh, in in here, if you go here, it was 7,109, and uh, then we need to pay in future additional this 1,185 if if it's uh, if it's uh, if we agree globally. And then this future supply chain total cost is 8,000, nearly 8,300 for this, uh, um, let's say, estimated. And we could go back to start page, um, because this, uh, maybe some of you are thinking that the why this inventory holding cost and price erosion cost were so high. It is uh, because uh, this 20 foot container what we are using it can carry 1654 of these products so uh, and our product was costing uh, 200 usd per uh, item so it is if you put uh, two zeros in the end it is already 165,000, and then it's uh, more than uh, it is 330,000 maybe is the value of the content. That is the reason why uh, our uh, inventory holding costs were so high over here. Then in these simulations it is easy for example if we now see for example that uh, air transportation will be much more expensive uh, in the future for example if the prices will double because of this crisis. We can change it and see what happens. So you can see here is that of course it won't affect inventory holding cost price erosion but the overall price will of course increase because of this um, of course if we have a longer delays for example instead of one week we will have to wait for two weeks um, this transportation by air will increase even further so so it is becoming very dear this is very probable in this uh, covid 19 situation what we have now because airlines are struggling so greatly now and um, in the end customers will pay and then you can see how the future supply chain cost with co2 emissions will, will develop but i believe uh, for you that uh, you can follow this chapter uh, please try to build this uh, railway model yourself and then try to replicate my results and, and you can see that for example railway model is it is emitting much much less even if we are using road transportation in the very end and even if the route is longer than the 6500 so uh, it is uh, it is in here we have estimated this from reliable sources so so you can see that railways really are 
competitive here. And if you think about airline industry in the near future, coming years, uh, I, I think uh, in the end, sustainable transportation most railways will in this game uh, or, or situation, they will hold a stronger card. But uh, thank you and please try this on your own. Okay, as a conclusion from all of these trials and uh, from background, what I gave you before this simulation is that we, we can we can say that the earlier transportation mode supply chain decisions they were rather easy. Um, markets were much more smaller. They were much more local over in, in that time, uh, but nowadays. Um, we have, we have a big global corporations, global opportunities, and the world is a big place, if, if you think about uh, population and so on. And um, it is not any more enough that we will, for example, make freight uh, decisions based on only, only on how much it costs per kilogram uh, or ton or per cubic meter. Um, these were feasible for low value added items, very cheap raw materials and so on. And um, and uh, basically local transportation and uh, this kind of uh, rather limited markets, but um, nowadays as um, things are changing so rapidly, we have for example at the moment this pandemic going on. Uh, I don't know what will be next year. Think about what has happened in this year. We have had uh, wildfires, for example, in Australia. Uh, the, and uh, m many other issues happened. Um, I, I, I don't know what is next year. We, we, we could be facing m much more complex problems in, in that time. And then we have um, increasingly technologically complex products available. They, they come and go. Um, product life cycles are short. Uh, then the markets are distant. Uh, corporations are big. And um, then we have uh, alternatives in, 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 let's say, in supply chains, in configuration of those. And um, then if you think about, in, in add on, on the top of this, we add uh, environmental demands. It is very complex, uh, as you saw already, that we have these inventory holding costs, uh, transportation costs, uh, price erosion, then possible cost from environment and so on. So it is, it is okay. and then we have lead time and so on. So it is, uh, then, for example, freight rates might change dynamically, like I illustrated. So it is not easy, and then therefore we need simulation and more comprehensive decision-making models. And um, many factors account, if you think about final result and decision made. And um, then we have to consider environment in different outcomes, how it could develop over time, and um, then make our decisions. And then, um, for example, these railway corridors that we have, um, they are rather interesting because they reach uh, from big city to big city, for example, from, for example, from uh, Chinese city of Xi'an or Hefei or from uh, uh, Luoyang or from uh, uh, other inland city uh, like Beijing. Uh, you, you can you can reach some bigger city in in Europe. It is unheard. You have a direct connection, uh, and then you can build rather sustainable supply chain over that because it doesn't emit that much, and the, the, the short lead time, and um, then it can be competitive, for example, against air freight easily, and then uh, uh, even um, I, I know at the moment. Uh, these uh, Chinese uh, trains, they receive some uh, financial support from the Chinese government. So even in many cases, they are, um, let's say, sustainable for in, in cost terms against uh, sea transportation. If it, 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 it's some part of a city pair, especially in Northern Europe, where, where you need to have feeder transport. But these kind of things, and thank you for your attention and interest.